Hello to everyone watching, uh, I'm Nick Vincent, and in this video I'll be talking about a paper from myself and co-authors Hanlin Lieb, Nicole Tilly, Stevie Chancellor, and Brent Hecht. And this paper is about data leverage, a framework for empowering the public in its relationship with technology companies. So we'll start off with a problem statement and a question. The problem, uh, data-dependent systems and tech company practices can cause serious societal harms. The question, uh, could a group of people who withhold, delete, poison, or redirect the data that they contribute to tech companies gain the leverage necessary to push these companies into changing their practices. Uh, as I hope we can convince you in the presentation and the paper, we think that together we can help make the answer to this question a resounding yes. So before diving in, here's a rough overview of what you can expect in this presentation. So first I'll define data leverage and various data levers, uh, which we conceptualize as tools in the public's tool belt. And then we'll discuss the strengths and weaknesses of these levers. Then I'll finish, finish by discussing what this all means for policy and research. And I'll also note that a key point in the paper is how data leverage really builds on so many different fields, including machine learning, uh, human-computer interaction, or HCI, uh, law, social science, and more. And it can benefit from so many findings and uh, so many types of findings. And so definitely check out the paper to see all these connections in more detail than I can convey uh, in this video format. So moving on to the backdrop for the work, uh, which I imagine may sound familiar to many watching. Starting quite a while ago, many people have raised serious concerns about both the tech industry and specific data-dependent technologies. Uh, so on this slide are just a few examples of the discussion of the topic in, in various venues. And of course, there's been a, a lot more discussion since then. So one prominent concern is that computing is and will continue to be an amplifier of economic inequality uh, via automation, superstar effects, the concentration of wealth. Um, but there's also many other harms which, which are related, uh, stemming from computing systems and tech company practices, uh, including uh, systems that amplify historical inequalities, uh, violations of privacy, threats to democracy, new long-term environmental threats, uh, exploitative labor practices, and more. So there's been a ton of very promising avenues for addressing, for responding to these concerns. So for instance, much, if not most of the research at FACT and uh, similar venues falls into the bucket of trying to address such harms. And there's also been recent progress in terms of tech worker organizing and other forms of political organizing. Um, long story short, we think that data leverage is a promising complement to, to all these avenues. So the idea behind data leverage uh, comes from the fact that the public is providing a huge amount of data fueling data-dependent technologies. So it, it's already widely accepted that people are contributing to company revenues as consumers who consume products uh, and, and view ads, et cetera. Um, but intelligent technologies are also uh, fueling company revenue and the public is fueling these intelligent technologies. So this has been called data labor, data labor and the reliance on data labor means that the public has basically two connections to uh, company revenues the, the well-acknowledged role as consumers, but also the second less appreciated role as data laborers who write reviews, click search results, watch videos, like tweets, create content, uh, and basically do anything else on a computer that can be recorded. So you might be wondering by now, well, where does the idea of, of leverage come in? What do you even mean by leverage? Um, am I talking about the physics of seesaws and civil engineering, debt in the finance world, uh, maybe the 2008 TV show that shows a group of good-hearted criminals who engage in elaborate schemes to gain influence over above-the-law evildoers? Uh, put simply, because data-dependent technologies rely on the public, the public has the ability to make these technologies worse or make a competitor's technologies better. And this is a potential source of leverage over the system's operators, because these are the kind of outcomes that the people in power might listen to. Um, so actually, it's a little bit of pushing mass via seesaws, a little bit of trying to gain influence through the elaborate schemes. Um, and again, tech companies rely so heavily on the public's data, which includes people's thoughts, relationships, uh, preferences, behaviors, and data leverage means taking advantage of this fact to give the public some heft to address harms in cases in which existing institutions might not be able to. So in other words, with a long enough lever, uh, you and your friends might be able to move uh, large firms. So now we have a definition for data leverage. What does it actually look like? I'm gonna provide some more uh, specific examples shortly, but at a high level, we can basically think of data leverage examples as falling into one of two buckets. So there's cases in which people try to bring down a system operated by their leverage target. So harming the performance of a recommender system, a search engine, something like that. And then cases in which a group of people boost up a technology to help another organization who can compete with the target of leverage. So maybe trying to help improve the recommender system or search engine of a new startup who wants to compete with uh, existing tech giants. So in discussing concepts like data leverage, it's often convenient to use terms like my data and your data and say, uh, you know, delete your data. Um, but there's actually very few cases in which a unit of data truly contains information about just one person. You can think about DNA, financial information, even just your movie and food preferences. And so these questions around data agency and data ownership and whose data are important, and they require navigating uh, various philosophical positions, various value systems. Uh, but data leverage itself is actually relatively ambivalent 
to your particular view on how you think we should um, we should view data agency and ownership. And that's because we can think of data leverage in terms just in terms of specific technology impacting actions people take, like withhold data, delete data, modify data, transfer data, uh, things like that. Uh, it's also important to note that data leverage draws heavily on machine learning and, and machine learning research, but it also applies to non-machine learning technologies. So even a company that uses uh, data from the public to choose if they should make more red shoes or blue shoes, um, you know, that they got data via shoe sales, surveys, uh, social media. This isn't necessarily ML or AI, but this kind of thing is still vulnerable to data leverage and data leverage applies to these kind of technologies. Uh, so now that we've set the stage a bit, I'll get into one of the main contributions of the paper, which is defining three clear categories of data leverage, which we call data levers. And a recurring theme I'll use here is that we see each lever as a tool in the public's tool belt. And another key point is that the data levers are tools that can, can be strengthened or tempered. Um, so new laws, research artifacts, uh, changes to how technologies are designed, all these things can boost the power of a particular data lever. And this is a point I'll return to at the end of the video. So what are the data levers? Uh, first, we can distinguish data levers that uh, lower a technology's performance from those that boost up a competitor. Um, so in the lower performance bucket, over here, we have two levers. So there's data strikes and then data poisoning. And then in the boost performance bucket, we have uh, conscious data contribution or CDC. So starting off with data strikes, in a data strike, a group of people withhold or delete uh, their data to lower a technology's performance. So you could imagine people using fake accounts to watch YouTube videos so that the view data isn't uh, tied to the real account and therefore used to improve uh, video recommendations to people like them. You might also think of uh, tracking blockers or deletion requests using new, new data protection laws, uh, requests to delete my data. A critical way data strikes will vary is based on whether participants have the legal right to, um, to delete their data. If they don't, they can only engage in withholding-based strikes where they stop uh, future data. So you can basically think of this as the difference between I'm cutting off my data starting tomorrow versus a request that you delete uh, all data about me from last year, maybe. And an important note that we really get into detail in the paper is that there's a lot of findings uh, from from prior work that highlight why cutting off tech is hard. It's not easy to just say, just quit using social media X. Um, and so that's an important consideration that, that we'll return to when we assess the data levers. And so those interested in the machine learning side of things might be thinking, well, um, why won't companies just delete the training data, but maybe keep the model weights that they learned, the parameters? Uh, we could call this data laundering. Um, and this is a question of regulation as well, but there's some early evidence uh, from the FTC, actually, that government bodies will enforce the actual deletion of weights, embeddings, parameters, um, basically that data, data laundering uh, could be stopped via regulation. So another key way that data strikes will vary is the degree of coordination and targeting. So data strikes could range from movements that uh, are organized via social media without much top-down coordination to very organized movements that make their del data deletions uh, decisions quite tactically. Um, so less coordinated strikes that are spread via via social media might have more participation, whereas more top-down coordinated uh, strikes could try to create targeted effects. For instance, deleting specific uh, types of images of image data or certain types of behavioral data. Um, okay, so now going on to data poisoning, that this is the second data lever in our uh, of three. And the basic idea here is to provide data that is deceptive and trains a technology to perform badly or to fail in some way. And data poisoning is, is very familiar to machine learning, been studied for a long time since the, since the 2000s. And examples could range here from just clicking like on a video that you actually hate um, to going in, opening up your images and making these pixel level manipulations so that the photos you upload will mess up a uh, computer vision system down the line. Uh, and a key way that data poisoning attacks will vary is in terms of how much knowledge about um, target technologies, how much tech skills, how much coordination attackers need. So on the simple end, uh, you can imagine just using a browser extension. So actually, ad nauseum is a browser extension uh, developed for obfuscation. And this basically clicks ads and lets you kind of perform a data poisoning attack without much effort uh, or without much uh, active you know, cognitive load. On the other hand, cutting edge attacks might require going in, finding the latest bleeding edge paper on archive, uh, implementing the algorithms in it, and uh, using that to, to craft this careful poison data. Uh, and it's also uh, something interesting to note is that if a, poison, a data poisoning attack is caught and the company deletes the poison data, uh, you basically have just reduced yourself to a data strike. So this is a kind of another variant where a, a failed data poisoning attack turns into a data strike. All right, so moving on to conscious data contribution now, and this is the third lever and it operates by boosting up a competitor's technology. So the basic idea here is to transfer data to or create new data for 
an organization you want to help compete with existing companies. So you can think of this as a data analog to conscious consumerism. Instead of voting with your wallet, you vote with your data. An example might be downloading uh, your purchase history from one platform to help a startup that you want to um, improve their ability to compete uh, by making better recommendations. So like with data strikes and poisoning, uh, there can be many variants of CDC. And, and specifically, CDC will vary in ways that are pretty similar to data strikes. So just as data deletion laws, data deletion laws um, allow for deletion-based data strikes that involve removing historical data, data portability laws could allow people to engage in CDC using their historical data, basically transferring their old data. Um, and just as data strikes may or may not involve pop-down coordination and targeting, the same is true for CDC. Um, so CDC does not require top-down coordination, but it could benefit it, benefit from it if it allows people to, for instance, try to contribute specific types of data or boost up a system in a very specific way, like um, focusing on movie ratings for a specific genre, for instance. So in the paper, we provide an early assessment of the data levers along three axes, uh, barrier to entry, legal and ethical considerations, and the potential impact of each lever. So first, considering barrier to entry, or uh, the factors that will make it hard to use at a hard to use a data lever, we arrived at a relative ranking. Uh, so data poisoning likely has the highest barrier to entry, uh, given that there's you need to have knowledge about the specific target technologies. You might need to have special uh, specific tech skills uh, to actually create the poison data, and it's going to require a lot of sustained effort. Um, for data strikes, there might not be quite as much uh, knowledge required or sustained effort, but there's still a lot of reasons why it's hard to quit using a technology. Um, so participation may be dependent on data protection law uh, or tools that make it easy to do things like uh, block trackers, uh, block trackers and uh, surveillance technology. Uh, finally, CDC, in many cases, is probably the easiest data lever to use. And that's because a person can keep using their current uh, technologies, whatever they're using right now, but then just uh, copy or, or kind of make a, make a backup of that data to contribute to other competing technologies uh, because data is, is non-rival or multiple firms can have the same data at once. So now turning to a very brief overview of legal and ethical considerations, um, which very brief because of the video format, see the paper uh, for lots more details. Um, so it seems like data poisoning will have the most serious questions to answer. And in particular, because data poisoning involves acting deceptively and trying to get systems to fail in major ways, there's immediate concerns about violating uh, moral standards around deception and also just creating uh, serious harms. Uh, and it's possible that the, the systems failing could cause more harm than the data leverage uh, actually helps. Uh, some data poisoning could even be illegal. So uh, CDC, for CDC, a major concern will be around the potential of boosting harmful technologies. Uh, so I'll return to this point in a minute. There's also serious privacy considerations around CDC. Again, uh, most data contains information about more than one person. So choosing to contribute that data to another firm uh, can be a tough call to make. Finally, data strikes probably are the easiest to justify both morally and legally. Um, so there's a major alignment between data strikes and privacy initiatives. Uh, privacy protecting behaviors in some cases are data strikes and laws that support data privacy will make it easier to data strike in general. Uh, so one way that researchers and organizers might navigate ethical questions around data leverage is by thinking about the effects of the technologies that a data lever is going to uh, help or harm. So uh, in short, some technologies are themselves harmful to society. And in short, if a technology is thought to be harmful to society, then uh, strikes and poison data strikes and data poisoning attacks might be most appropriate. Uh, on the other hand, if it's widely accepted that a particular technology is quite helpful to society, CDC might be more, more appropriate. Um, and this classification is really hard. Obviously, um, people with different value systems might make different uh, choices as to what they think is a helpful system and a harmful system. And this is an area where the fact community is particularly well positioned to help uh, navigate this really tough uh, classification challenge and basically help people figure out what data levers are more appropriate for a particular situation or a particular technology. Okay, so now before talking about potential impact, I want to walk through a, a quick example of a, how data strikes and CDC interact with learning curves, or scaling laws, basically the relationship between machine learning performance and training data set size. And this is uh, from a 2021 CSUW paper on conscious data contribution. Um, so here we have a plot of the relationship between machine learning test accuracy on the y-axis and then what fraction of a data set is available on the x-axis. So the curve, we see diminishing returns and this probably this curve looks quite familiar if you've looked at these kind of learning curves in uh, machine learning research before. And uh, what this means is that if 20% of users uh, who contributed data to this system were to engage in a data strike and delete their data, 
it would actually have minimal effect on the classifier performance because it's already in this flat uh, diminishing returns horizontal region on the right side here or on the high data side here. So now if 20% of users instead engaged in conscious data contribution and give their data to a new small company, they would bring that small company's performance from 10%, the random guest baseline, up to 80%. So CDC hugely reduces the performance gap between the two companies. Um, and this is basically a huge consideration for thinking about potential impact. Uh, so generalizing, we might say that small strikes will probably have a very small impact, whereas large strikes will have a huge impact. Uh, and this is because of the shape of these learning curves and scaling laws. On the other hand, uh, CDC by a small group will have a large impact, but larger groups will run into the same diminishing returns that are familiar to machine learning researchers. Uh, for data poisoning, effectiveness is going to be pretty case specific, uh, but the research in this area does suggest there's a lot of ways that a small group of attackers could do very high uh, damage per participant. So returning to our lever imagery, if we have tech company practices on the right, shown as this heavy object, because there's a ton of reasons why it's hard to change these practices. So incentive structures that drive businesses, the historical and organizational contexts in which these uh, companies exist, basically uh, Mountain's research on organizational science, sociology, uh, et cetera. Um, we might think of uh, data strikes as kind of this, this short lever where it might be easy to get a lot of people to join your data strike because of the low barrier to entry, but the impact might be limited by, by the, um, these learning curves and the ability to actually harm a technology. On the other hand, we could think of CDC as somewhat of a longer lever because a smaller group could have a bigger impact. And then finally, data poisoning is the longest lever of all, but it's shown here a bit precariously because if uh, a company comes up with an antidote or basically uh, a defense against a particular data poisoning attack, then the data poisoning attack is nullified and you've just reduced to a small data strike. Okay, so now I've laid out a set of tools in the public's tool belt. And as I mentioned before, these are tools that can be tempered by researchers, designers, and policymakers. And so for policy, there's a great opportunity for privacy and data protection laws to provide a win-win. Um, so right to delete will make it easier to data strike. A right to data portability will make it easier to engage in CDC. However, of course, CDC does have a lot of tension around privacy and, and choices to contribute data. And so that will be an ongoing concern. Um, policy can also help set legal standards around data poisoning. So making it clear what is and isn't illegal could make it a lot easier for people to decide if they want to actually engage in a data poisoning attack. And while I do hope there's some policymakers watching, I imagine a greater number of viewers uh, may be researchers. And luckily, we've got a lot to say to you. Um, so a really exciting idea is this uh, research area around data leverage assistance. So drawing on many fields, could we build software that basically supports data leverage and lowers the barrier to entry? Uh, so imagine a website that allows you to go search for ongoing movements, uh, drawing on search technologies, uh, studies of social movements. Then you download a browser extension, drawing on HDI and design. And then there's uh, maybe a data strike option, which draws on the obfuscation literature, things like ad nauseum. A data poisoning option, which uh, draws on the latest machine learning research. A CDC option. Uh, and basically, all these things would make it a lot easier to join a data leverage movement. On the collective action and social movement side, uh, there's a lot of opportunities to ask questions around how data leverage will be different or similar to other social movements. And in particular, are there cases in which findings from, uh, from social science and social movements can be used to support data leverage and figure out what would make data leverage more successful? For ML and AI, there's a lot of opportunities to study data levers. Uh, so on the one hand, with machine learning simulation methods like uh, learning curves and scaling laws, uh, basically, these methods, the methods that are used to, to study learning curves and scaling laws, are telling us about data leverage. Um, on the other hand, machine learning and AI could also just study uh, study these things in the wild or, or with real world experiments that try out that try to answer things like, here's what the model would look like if 30% of users uh, deleted their data. And we could also we could even think about this as uh, telling us something about machine learning explainability. So to end with a summarizing point. Uh, data leverage provides a new way of thinking about the negative impacts of computing systems. And we're really excited about the potential for this to complement uh, a lot of other ongoing work in the field. So a big thank you. Thanks to my co-authors, colleagues, reviewers, the work that came before. Big thanks to you for watching. And then I'll end on this slide uh, with all my co-authors' names and then some contact info. Uh, we'd love, if you have any thoughts about this work, uh, we would love to hear from you. So please definitely send a note. Uh, thanks so much for watching again and have a wonderful day.